And um, yeah, you can avoid this if you have a lossless coding, so which is intra-frame coded, meaning each um, image stands for itself, then you can cut it any position. Also, you have uh, you can avoid the uh, complexity when you want to combine <coughs> tools together in a workflow. Uh, if you want to stay with your file format, you have to make sure that every tool supports this format, can read it and introduces no further tweak encoding, no generation loss. Um, if you use a lossless codec, it doesn't depend um, which lossless codec it, in the end the tool is using. It can be uncompressed or maybe FFU1 or other fulfilled codecs. Uh, if the tool understands this and does a lossless conversion between the formats, you have no generation loss. So the key questions when looking at container formats uh, are what format properties are useful when considering the archive workflows. And um, we at our company made some experiences with custom projects and now I try to make a summary a bit of um, what properties I think are useful and uh, what can we learn from existing audio and video container formats. Um, I'm not only focusing on Matroska here because um, my experience mainly bases on, on the audio parts on broadcast wave files, BWS. And uh, for video, we initially settled on AVI as a container format with FFV1 stored inside. Uh, because at that point in time, the support in tools was not that big, but that is to be changed, so um, I will try to have a look at all these container formats. Um, how does an archive look like? This is, of course, simplified, but tries to make a point, uh, which is the, the physical carrier in the analog archive is the central piece of the archive. It is the entity that needs to be preserved and it is shared. Um, the archive, more or less, it is um, an index um, storing metadata about the carrier um, and also tracks position who has the physical entity. And the physical entity, the carrier is used in layout systems and other uses in production, possibly. This changes a bit um, when we transition into a digital archive where we have digital files. We have the physical carrier and transform it through some inches process in a digital file format and store that in a media archive. Um, preserve it there, but of course we want to use it so there are export processes running uh, which deliver the digital files to the layout system, <coughs> the broadcast um, department, producers, and other users. So, um, the physical carrier was the center of it in the analog archive and the digital archive we have some digital files sort of possibly big media servers that are a bit the center here. So now let's have a look at the interest process. What are the parts of the interest process? The interest process um, which transforms or records the data on the carrier into a digital file um, is simplified um, as a two-step process, meaning there's a read layer, some hardware, which replays the physical carrier, and there's some recording software, which puts the data and stores it into some file format. But this is very simplified. If we look uh, deeper into the process, we see that um, either in the hardware itself um, or some external hardware, there are AD converters that um, take the analog signal and digitize it. And uh, after the file is written to disk, there are often following processes like some quality checking, meaning um, to either manually just inspect every file that is um, put into the archive, if the interest process was performed correctly, if there has been whatever 
Um, the analog signal has overflows, there's other stuff, and of course there are supporting tools that can try to find some problems during the incest um, process and give you some indications, meaning some drop frame count or other um, statistics that can support you here in, in the quality check. So the, the chain gets longer and longer. Um, when we think about um, Shellac recordings or other things, they might be filters added here, even DM passes, filters or other things. And um, yeah, the, the, the quality check can also happen. Um, you can add metadata or other things here and write them into the archive file at, in a later step. So the chain can get longer and longer, and we can we add. Uh, more tools into the process. Um, so when we started to make uh, digitizing workflows, we decided that we will not use only one codec to the whole workflow, at least the digital part of the workflow. Um, we separated a bit between a mezzanine format, meaning some in between formats, which is not going into the archive, just through the workflow used there, and some archive formats. The reason for that was um, processing power, meaning for processing speed. Um, we use some low compression coding, which is um, PUFU, or FFP hub, um, during the ingest and quality check steps and then later convert it into a highly compressed format which is FFP1 then and put it into archive. And uh, what can we say also is that the ingest flow uh, needs a special care because in the, in the best case it's performed only once and you have the digital representation and maybe not now, but in 20 years or something like that, the physical carrier um, will be destroyed and we operate only on the digital part of it. So um, it's important to know how the interest process was done so we can later have a look at it if we find out that whatever, some computer had a problem or other thing, uh, we can later find out which, which computer was this carrier digitized. This, um, in the audio world, in the broadcast wave file, well, there are chunks for this. This is the coding history chunk where it's a bit weird, uh, has a weird format, but basically it has a line for line entry where you say, um, this step, the AD converter was of this brand mark and this type and maybe serial number if you know it. Um, then we added a DM passes filter with the, that parameters, the interest application software was this software version, this and that. So it's clearly documented um, which was done, um, what was done on the carrier. And in video, currently we just um, use our own file format, it's a separate file, interest report, it's an XML structure um, where we store which um, step was done on which machine and what was performed with which task parameters. And also an important property or an important thing during the interest is that we have to add checksums. This was also mentioned before. It's important to um, later to be able to find out if the archive file is still in good shape, if all the frames are okay. So there are frames, checksums, and also we can we add a file a hash for the for the total file. So we can verify later if everything <coughs> is in the same shape as it was during interest and policy check. Now we go to the export process. It's a similar here. Um, it is more or less um, just a two-step process in two flavors. Uh, we have uh, here uh, creating an export media file. Often we are just taking a segment out of the interested file. The interested file will be hours long, a few hundred gigabytes of video data, 
and we only need a specific speech out of it or an audio a song or something like this, so we extract ranges. Uh, we transcode it into a different target format, something like this. And uh, also we export it, of course, with metadata to be able to understand the file in the layout system or for users. And we either um, export metadata separately, it's separate, it's an L file often, or we try to embed metadata, like add some text into MP3 or something like this um, to identify the file. So this summarizes the things I said before. We often have only segments of the media file. And um, we often extract also metadata alongside with it. And the export flow, of course, is executed multiple times uh, per media file. And we have a transcoding into some target media format, possibly. So here now we have the list of audio properties that we store uh, currently um, in our database before uh, the reason we must store it into the file. All of them is because not all of them have a mapping into the, the container format. So we store the, the properties we can, we store in the container format, and things we cannot store in the container format, uh, we also store it uh, redundant uh, in the database and use it then later in the export. Um, I think most things are familiar, like the encoding of the audio stream, uh, sample rate values, these are just examples here, of course. Um, channel count, uh, <coughs> width, and bit rates for compressed format, or uncompressed format, we don't for bit rate. And um, then we have a thing which we call it audio rules which is a mix of the, um, the language, possibly, of the audio stream and the channel assignment of it. I will make some examples here. If we store a simple stereo file with unknown language or other pro um, name of the audio stream, we just give it a number, the first stream, or maybe the only stream in the file, and it has a left and right channel, so the audio rules are stream one and left channel, and a separator here, and stream one and right channel. And if we have two stereo streams together <coughs> with our audio file, um, and in this case, um, here we, yeah, it is identified during quality check or interest. Um, uh, the first stereo stream ha is an English language and there's a German voice over um, to it. This tries to mimic the, the ESO language uh, identifiers here. But, um, we get this audio role string, meaning the, in the English stream here is left and right channel, then the German voice over stream is left and right channel. And um, during, often during interest, there is no known channel assignment and whatever. So then we also have the, the wild card where we say the channel assignment is just unknown. We have a, a tape with eight channels. So we have one audio stream with unknown channel locations and that's it. And of course, in other file formats like um, in MXF, you usually you try to make, um, if you have unknown channel um, positions, to make mono streams out of it. So this would be the case here. here we have eight streams, and each um, stream is mono, so we have one to eight with unknown channel position. That's how we store this information. Now, if we look at video, we have more properties <coughs> here, and um, but most of them, I guess, are also quite familiar. Um, we also, of course, here saw the encoding, frame range, frame sizes. These are typical values. 
yield order and uh, bit depth, bit rate also only for compressed formats, uh, the color format, the color matrix used if it is the standardized thing, and subsamp, chroma subsampling which was used. All these things uh, possibly are mapped into the uh, container format. Other things maybe are also stored in, in the codec itself. And um, the last we really want here to display aspect ratio, I guess also is a, a common known property, but um, we also then added a bit a display alignment information property which is used, um, or I will make an example later, when you not only store the visible parts, but the maybe invisible or invisible parts on the tape. So you know which parts of the stored image is visible or not. And also we have the active image area property, which describes um, the, the active part of the visible um, area. We will see some examples now. <coughs> um, so this is an example of a video frame that is interested. The red border here shows um, which parts are digitized. And you see here that we have some invisible, invisible area where the width time code here is stored. And uh, this is just archived because we want to possibly later read out the time code or some um, target formats also use uh, this um, for um, for storing like the, the NSF format where we always add also this um, top line here. And in this case, our video properties look like we store the frame size here, which is the full frame area. We store a display aspect ratio, which is 6 to 9. But um, we have to take care that uh, that this aspect ratio only applies to the part which is visible and not to the invisible part. So we add here another property which says, okay, we have an um, invisible part and the visible part is aligned to the bottom center here of the stored frame and it has a height of 576 pixels, meaning there are 32 pixels on top which are not shown. So that playing software knows, okay, the display aspect ratio um, applies to the yellow border thing. And um, example for the active image area. Uh, the active image area has also some property, the active field description maybe, I've heard about it in FX screens, it's a similar property there. Um, it describes that uh, this is the, the stored image but it has been letterboxed at some point, so uh, we have black bars at the bottom and, uh, and on the top. And if we want to describe that, because possibly later in the export process, uh, we want to normalize all our uh, video data or <coughs> into the layout system for 6 to 9 aspect ratio. If we add that information here, the, the export um, process or they, it will just remove the black borders here and have the 6 to 9 aspect ratio. If we do not store this um, information, we cannot know if it is <coughs> 4 to 3 or 6 to 9 with letterbox borders around it. So we would either have to decide this intellectually as a human on each file or for some we would have to add some algorithms and stuff like that. And putting all these things together, um, in this example we have this um, invisible area here, <coughs> the yellow here is the visible area, and just the green border. So here we describe that the active part is only a subset of the display. Now, um, so to make a summary under this single 
have these properties now mapping to the container formats that we use, which can be used in which container format is listed here. Um, in the audio case, um, uh, the interest report, meaning the history of what has been done on the file, it can be stored more or less uh, in the coding history chunk of the DWF. Um, with AV, we do not have some uh, the possibility to store it in the into the container, to store it separately. Uh, with with Matroska, we currently have, do not have the possibility, but um, I think the likely event is that we will just add it as an attachment possibly and either use our own format or maybe some standard format like Premix in the future to uh, include this into the archive file. Um, then the metadata tagging, which is used in the export processes, uh, broadcast wave file, we have only very limited amount of metadata tags available. There are some info chunks in, in uh, the lib uh, specification, but it's only, it's not very good supported on the players to read them out. If, uh, yes, it's here, AVI, with just uh, practically no metadata tagging taking place, but with, with Matroshka, yes, it has a very um, sophisticated metadata tagging um, possibilities. That's very good. Um, then the, the partial file retrieve requirements, and this comes from the request to extract sub ranges from a, a bigger file. And um, often the, the big video files are stored on tape systems, and we do not want to read all the tapes just to extract one little part of the speech. Um, so we have the requirements that some storage providers possibly have the possibility to read all the parts of the tape and generate a new valid file, which is then used in the export to speed up the whole process. And with AVI and FF3.1, there is the support for this, but currently, um, I don't know of any support with this in Matroska. But um, yeah, maybe um, anybody of you knows some utility of this, so um, please contact me if you know a solution here. Storing the audio stream name, meaning the language or some other information like it was an original recording or a voiceover or other thing. Um, this is not possible to be stored in DWF. I also not, but in Matroshka, yes, we have standard text for storing the language, or we can use uh, the metadata tagging system, which is um, which allows to add text even to single streams, not to the whole file completely, but you, you can add text to separate streams. Meaning you can say audio stream one has the name of this or some comment of that, and the audio channel position. We can store that in the broadcast wave file. There's a channel mask where you can say, okay, this four channel setup is whatever left, center, right, and um, effect channel. Um, also in AVI, it's the same chunk. Um, technically, you can store the channel position, but from my knowledge, there's currently no, pos uh, no possibility to store the channel mapping in Matroshka. It just assumes. Uh, a specific mapping. If you have two channels, it's to stereo, to my knowledge. Yeah, please correct me if you know better. And um, the display alignment, meaning saying only a sub part of the stored frame, uh, video frame, is visible. We cannot store the information in AVI. But in Matroshka, yes, we have there the pixel crop properties where you can say, okay, um, we have okay, we store this image, but the visible part is only that, and we uh, apply it to the display aspect ratio only on the that visible sub part of it, which is possible here. And 
the active image area currently there is no support in video formats. I only know the MPEG transport screen, which has the property for it. But, uh, to my knowledge, there is no other video container format that allows for in this property. Um, the field order um, in AVI, there is no property to store. The field order is the upper field first, lower field first for interlaced material. Um, but the Patrashka, yes, I guess this is a quite new addition where we can say, okay, uh, we have upper field first and just play upper field first and other possibilities to specify. And the color matrix um, that was used to during recording um, AI, there is also no possibility to store that in this container format. Uh, the Patrashka, to my knowledge, yes, um, this is possible to be stored there. Yeah. Okay, so um, also one part of the reason to go in here to the symposium for me was now um, to pitch a bit to share experiences. So um, if you have experiences with storing some properties and have found <coughs> solutions, of course, um, I would welcome you to get in touch with me or just tell me or ask me um, your requests and your stories. Um, especially regarding um, these properties here. <coughs> okay, so that's it. Necessity of the system parsing the header. Would that be an option? To like, you, for example, you cut it up in minute chunks, yes. and then you, you put like, um, how much is it? One thousand. <coughs> uh, no, no math in my head today. In my head today, uh, you, you have one segment per minute, and you have the information there linked together, and then you could ask the storage system like, give me minute. Five to many to twenty five, which would be fifteen files, and the source system would not need to parse anything, and then you just like concatenate them and transcode them together. Would that be an option? Yes, that would be an option to to make uh, multiple files, meaning each file is just uh, one minute of recording media and this story. But um, then you have um, left uh, storing it, everything as one file. Thing and you're partially going back to storing only like you did with uh, storing frame per frame as of a separate file. Of course, it's not, it's like, it's like it's it's not that complex <laughs> yeah. uh, with storing each frame as a separate file. Yes, it's a, it's a mix of these mm -hmm. techniques. Yes, um, that would be, would be a possibility. But yes, of course, you have to add a complexity of handling multiple files per storage entity. Yes, you can. You can see that um, the video data is just 
One part of the archive information package I'm interested for is with the separate other part of the of the whole thing. Yes. That's there's no real urgency to, to put the interest report, according history, and all the other information into the video file itself. Um, but yes, we have requests from customers that they want to have uh, the file um, being the archive information package so that uh, if in case the database fails, it's corrupted or whatever thing, they only have to look at the file, media file, and get enough information to be able to restore the archive information package, or as, as, at least as much as possible out of it. Yeah, so, some examples or more info on, on how often you have to assist uh, collection holders in making the decision for a certain container format. How often will they listen to your opinion or just stick with what they know? Um, how often? Um, well, basically, often the there is already a decision is already made there when you when you as an archive start want to start in, um, interesting and digitizing stuff. Um, you often have already have something. Might to uh, to use as the format for storing here. Yeah. Um, so at the moment, I think most archives uh, they switch or they are convinced with Epic V1, but um, there are uh, exceptions where we, they want to have the the codec um, left as is. Yeah. Yeah, I think my, my question is more like, like the chart is really useful to this audience, but is it also something that you use in conversations with, with archives when, when they're at that point of, of hiring you or using this? Or, or is that just left, left to them? No, of course, yes. We're trying to, to make arguments that uh, using a lossless format and the integrating uh, codec is, um, has benefits for for the archive instead of using the digital material coming from the digital cameras as is. Yeah.